Many pages in Berlin's diary tell of scenes like this November night when the RAF was systematically burning the heart of Germany. These pictures have just come to light. They were taken by an Austrian cameraman unbeknown to the Germans. Daylight and the shattering effect of air bombardment is disclosed. When the full story of Berlin's fall comes to be written, it'll be seen how great was the RAF's contribution to victory. Today, queues for the few available buses and trams swell to fantastic lengths. Brick by brick, Berlin women, old and young, are employed in the colossal task of clearing the rubble. The thousands volunteer for this work. They get extra food coupons for doing it. Go slow work means more rations. Alongside the cleaning up process, there's an apathy in the Berliner's outlook. Discarded war material for roundabouts and park benches. Life grinds on. The first warm Sunday afternoon since Germany surrendered brings Berlin civilians out for their favorite Sunday walk. Creatures of habit still, you'll find them strolling in the once fashionable Charlottenburg district. The few surviving sidewalk cafes are crowded with well-dressed people drinking thin beer and fruit-flavored water. The same afternoon, a big crowd saw a Sunday race meeting at Karlshorst. The Russians were in charge. Red Army men and girls sported a ruble or two on the famous trotting races. Open air markets hand out the Berliner's allowance of dehydrated potatoes. The ration is two and a half pounds and it has to last for 10 days. Yes, they do it in Berlin too. Field Marshal Montgomery greets Marshals Zhukov and Rokossovsky, who directed the Red Army's assault on Berlin. By order of the King, he invested Zhukov with the GCB. Next day was British Day, Friday the 13th. Major General Lyne, governor of British-occupied Berlin, took the salute at the great march past of the British garrisons. Guns and armoured vehicles, six abreast, mass tanks in formation, four abreast, and painted a dark green, headed the display along the Charlottenburg chassis. A German mobile gun provides a grandstand seat. Past the saluting base went the 131st Brigade, the 8th Hussars, a complete searchlight battery, engineers, troop carriers and mobile artillery. Behind the guns came a detachment of the Royal Navy, followed by the Grenadier Guards, the Queens, the Devons, a Canadian battalion, the Service Corps and men of the RAF and the RAF Regiment. President Truman lands at Antwerp from the cruiser Augusta en route for the Big Three Conference at Berlin. Last time Mr. Truman came to Europe was in a troop ship in 1918 when he was serving as an American Army artillery officer. At Brussels airport were General Eisenhower and other service chiefs. The president climbed the tall gangplank to the giant Skymaster aircraft, which was formerly President Roosevelt's personal plane. Mr. Churchill's Skymaster was the 13th to land at Potsdam, bringing top-ranked delegates to the Berlin Conference. Prominent among early arrivals in the British delegation were the service chiefs Admiral Cunningham, 
Field Marshal Brooke and Air Marshal Portal. Other delegates were Mr. Eden, later reported to be ill, and Mr. Atley. Moments of triumph for Mr. Churchill came when he toured the ruins of the German capital. Looking very fit after his holiday at Ondai, the Premier was accompanied by Mr. Eden and Junior Commander Mary Churchill. From the steps of the Reich Chancellery, the party visited the now legendary air raid shelter and the place where the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun were said to have been seen burning. The Big Three meeting, on which the world's hope of lasting peace depends, began in an ornately decorated conference hall. A red star in flowers lends a touch of brightness to the scene. Green uniformed Russian security guards are everywhere. Before the start of the conference, Mr. Churchill called on Mr. Truman at the President's residence called the Little White House. The Premier renewed a now long-standing acquaintance with Generalissimo Stalin in the conference room with its 12-foot plush-covered table and richly carved furniture. Mr. Truman, a newcomer to the team, was appointed chairman of the conference. Interpreters have a busy time. Millions look to Berlin. There, of all places, the world's future is being shaped. 